Welcome back to the swamp my friends and welcome if you're new. Today we're going to be sharing some creepy and downright strange stories with cryptic creatures. Now it doesn't matter where you live or where you hide, Bigfoot is going to find you and tickle your toes brother. These stories will surely freak you out. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everybody here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Now, without further ado, let us jump right into these creepy and allegedly true cryptid encounter horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. The Veiled One by That Town Guy In the heart of the dense, shadow-draped forest where the twisted branches whispered secrets and ancient trees stood sentinel in silence, a creature lurked that instilled terror into the bravest of souls. The locals spoke in hushed tones about the legend of the Veiled One, a monstrous entity that dwelled in the darkest corners of the forest. The tale began with friends seeking adventure their laughter echoing throughout the moonlit clearing as they set up camp for the night. A night fire crackled, casting dancing shadows on the towering trees surrounding them. As the night wore on, their animated stories faded into subdued whispers and a chill settled over the air. Unbeknownst to the campers, the veiled one emerged from deep within the forest. Its presence was felt rather than seen, an evil force that stirred the essence of fear in the hearts of those unlucky to cross its path. The temperature dropped and an eerie mist slithered through the underbrush, wrapping the trees in a spectral embrace. One by one, all the campers succumbed to an inexplicable unease. A rustle in the leaves, a distant howl, and the feeling of unseen eyes watching them caused the group to exchange nervous glances. As the night deepened, an unsettling quiet descended upon the campsite, broken only by the distant hooting of an owl. In the silence, one of the campers, Sarah, ventured into the woods to relieve herself. She moved cautiously, the damp leaves underfoot muffling her steps. The shadows seemed to elongate twisting into grotesque shapes that played tricks on her mind. A whisper, barely audible, murmured her name from the shadows. Sarah. She froze, her breath caught in her throat. The whisper grew more insistent, drawing her deeper into the labyrinth woods. Panic set in as the familiar landmarks blurred and she realized she was lost. The once familiar trees stood like looming specters, and the moon struggled to pierce the thick canopy above. As Sarah stumbled through the underbrush, the forest seemed alive with sinister energy. The air thickened, and the whispers became unholy chants, resonating with ancient power. Shadows danced at the edge of her vision, and a pair of glowing eyes maternalized before her. The eyes of the Veiled One. A guttural growl echoed through the darkness, and Sarah's instinct screamed at her to flee. She sprinted through the twisted trees, branches clawing at her face, the creature hot on her heels. Desperation fueled her, and she burst into the clearing where the campsite should have been. The campsite had vanished. To her horror, only leaving a barren expanse of twisted roots in cold earth, the whispers intensified now a cacophony of hateful voices. The Veiled One closed in, a looming figure wraithed in shadows. In a final act of defiance, Sarah turned to face the creature. Its proper form remained hidden beneath a tattered cloak of darkness. The whispers grew louder, drowning out her screams as the Veiled One enveloped her in inky tendrils. The following day, the remaining campers awoke to find the clearing intact. The fire still flickering, yet Sarah was gone, swallowed by the ancient woods, her fate sealed by the evil presence that roamed the shadows. The Veiled One 
a creature that waited patiently for the next unsuspecting soul to wander into its domain, never to be heard from again. I would like to think that this creature just disappeared, or that no more campers went in those woods, but truly, I have not the slightest clue. White Creatures in the Woods by Anonymous I have seen hundreds of these things at night in the woods in the rural areas around Memphis starting around 2020. They are tall, humanoid creatures with blacked out eyes, moving slowly and in strange, jerky movements. The first time I saw them, I was visiting a veteran friend who was down on his luck. It was sometime around midnight on Thanksgiving Day in 2020. He lived on his brother's property in a rundown camper vehicle at the edge of the woods between his camper and the tree line. There were the remains of an old trailer that had been destroyed by a tornado in years past, with a street light on top of the pole that was used to run electricity to the destroyed mobile home on the other side of the pole, which was approximately 15 yards of a field that had a dirt road that split in half with tall grass and brush at the edge of the far side. Then the tree line which started on the opposite. They were people hiding at first. They seemed to be grouping more in the darker areas where the light from the pole was not as bright. I asked my friend about them and shrugged it off and said they were always there and they didn't bother them. He also said that no matter what you did, you couldn't get close to one, no matter how fast you were. So being a combat veteran with two deployments under my belt and my firearm from my vehicle, I attempted to approach these things. As I got closer, I noticed they were solid white creatures with solid black eye sockets that moved in a jerky but prolonged manner. There had to be at least 50 or more in that field, down the dirt road, and at the edge of the tree line and beyond. Determined to let something mess around and find out, I continued to walk towards them, and all of a sudden, they looked at me with black, empty-looking sockets, and instantly caused me to feel more fear than I have ever remembered having in my lifetime. I did not approach them that night. I turned away, left the area, and took my buddy to stay a few days in my place. Since the first time I saw them, I have seen them about a dozen times always at night and around wooded areas at different locations. I have since tried to run and catch them and fail because the creature simply disappears the moment I close in within 5 to 10 yards. Anytime I lose direct eye contact for a mere flash of a second, they seemingly up and vanish. It's like they can phase in or out or something. If you get in close, you can see the weird jerky movements is like a part of them. Their arms, legs, and head seem to all move at different times and in different positions. They disappear any time they move, so they cannot be seen if they walk. I have pumped 45 incendiary rounds from my AR-15 into one without a single shred of evidence of it left behind. These things make audible noise that can be recorded but do not show up on a video or any cell phone recording. I have brought out old analog camcorders with cassette tapes and don't even see anything happening as well. I don't know if they have some sort of frequency thing that they can do to avoid all of these things, but it's very un of this earth. Animals also see them. However, I have tried to show them to people, and only about half of those I have shown them to see them. I have wondered if I was losing my mind, and if anyone else has seen them and tried other experiments like I have. I have searched all over the internet, and only found a few cryptic creatures that share one or two similar things with them, but nothing comes close enough to say that it's a match. The only close thing was the origin of white zombies. Sort of, anyway. A few people tell me this could be a shape-shifting creature. They are different sizes, some more prominent, some smaller, and they do group up in what I have come to call family clusters, four to five of them, usually with two taller ones and one or two smaller ones. The Cave Creature by 
Emo Lover 115. I was around 11 years old in this story. For context, my friends, I, Evie, Gail, and Liam, all loved playing in the sagebrush fields by my neighborhood and exploring the cliffs that looked over the valley. I was always the ringleader of the group, bringing them along to chase rabbits, catch snakes, or build forts below the cliffs. Just dumb kid stuff. One day, Evie told me that a friend of hers found two caves in the sagebrush and gave her directions to find them herself. I thought this would be perfect for a group adventure, so I rounded up my friends to search for these caves. The first one was at the bottom of a smallish cliff, so we climbed down, one by one. It was clearly a hangout spot for teenagers or something, since the ground was littered with empty beer cans and liquor bottles. The rocky walls were covered in graffiti, and there was an old tattered blanket in the furthest corner. However, there was nothing of interest to a bunch of 6th graders, so we moved on. The second cave was way smaller. Not even one person could fit inside. I guess if you really wanted to, you could cram yourself in and sit down. But it was extremely claustrophobic. All four of us huddled around the mouth of the cave, peering inside. Of course, I was closest and could see more than others, and noticed a wide tunnel that led deep into the rocks. In the very back of that tunnel, I caught movement. I looked closer, squinting my eyes to adjust to the darkness, trying to figure out if I was actually seeing something. There was a medium-sized animal, if you could even call it that, facing away from us, crouched over and breathing heavily. It was pretty much bald, with a few clumps of hair in its back. It was incredibly thin, and I could see the outline of its spine and ribs. Gail, look! I pointed down the tunnel and moved away so he could see. He hesitated before speaking. What is that? I was relieved that he saw it too, but the feeling of unease became stronger the more time we spent near the cave. How would I know? I responded. I moved closer to look at it again. Liam and Evie... Both stood a safe distance, nervous and preparing to escape if something went horribly wrong. I think they also felt the lingering sense of danger, but were smart enough to stay away. My 11-year-old brain thought the best course of action was to pick up a rock and hit the thing with it, to try to make it move. And thinking back on it, that was the worst possible thing I could have done. My friends watched as I grabbed a rock off the ground and chucked it hard, hitting the thing right in the back. As soon as the rock struck it, the thing swung its head around and stared at me with these horrific, blank eyes that ripped through my soul and nearly made me crap my pants. Adrenaline and utter terror surged through my body, and I did not stick around to see if that thing was coming after me. I nearly fell down the side of the cliff climbing up to safety. My friends were equally as terrified, repeatedly asking if what I saw actually happened. Neither me or Gail had a solid answer as to what that thing was just a description of those dreadful eyes and its bare skin in the dark corner. Unknown Creature by Professional Walk I was out camping in the woods with a group of friends when we encountered something that still gives me chills to this day. It was late at night and we were huddled around the campfire telling ghost stories and roasting marshmallows. Suddenly, we heard a strange noise coming from the trees. It sounded like a low growl, but it was unlike any animal noise we had ever heard before. We shrugged it off and continued with our night, but the sound grew louder and more frequent as the night wore on, and it became increasingly harder to try to ignore it or pass it off as some sort of animal. At one point, we heard something moving in the bushes nearby. We shone our flashlights in the direction of the noise, but we couldn't see or make out anything. It was much too dark and too dense with trees and brush. As the night progressed, the noises grew more and more intense. We could hear something moving around our campsite, circling like a shark, but we couldn't see anything in the darkness. It was like something was watching us, stalking us from the shadows. We decided to pack up and leave, but as we started to gather our things, we heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the trees. It was a sound that made our hearts stop in terror. We could feel something watching us, waiting for us to make a move. 
We ran. We ran as fast as we could back to our car. But we could hear something following us, hot on our heels. It was like the creature was right there, waiting to get us, waiting for somebody to slip. It was like it was breathing down our necks. We finally made it to the car and sped away, our hearts pounding in our chest. To this day, we still don't know what the heck that creature was. We don't know what we encountered in the woods that night. It was something unknown, unexplainable, something that still haunts our memories and makes us shiver with fear. A Night in Horror by Electrical Line 6982 My name is Heinrich, and I live in Sweden. I will tell you a story that happened to me years ago, but I will never forget it. The worst night and time of my life. I apologize already now that my English is not the best, but I hope you still understand anyway. In 2004, I worked as a forklift driver at a large furniture company in the small town of Husqvarna in Sweden. I loaded and unloaded trucks and collected goods that were going with them. I moved there after school with some friends, who also worked at the same company. I met a girl, and everything went well, and I lived life. But in 2007, it came to a break with my girlfriend, and my friends from school had started to move away so I felt that I didn't have much left in Husqvarna. I started thinking about moving away, maybe going back home to my childhood town of Karlstad, which is 300 kilometers north, where my parents and childhood friends still lived. Karlstad is close to the border with Norway, and one of my friends, Tobias, has started to work as a forklift driver for a Norwegian company in Oslo. A Swede earns almost three times more to work in Norway than in Sweden, so many Swedes try to get a job there. So when my friend Tobias from Norway said I could come to Oslo and look for a job at the company he worked for, I didn't hesitate. To get to Oslo from Husqvarna, you must drive about an hour west towards Gothenburg, Sweden's second largest city, and from there, move the other four hours on a highway called E6 with two lanes in both directions with some wire railing between the north-going side and the south-going side. The south-going side moves through primarily dense forest. In fall and wintertime, the E6 is heavily trafficked by trucks and other heavy vehicles. As a rule, trucks drive in the right lane, while other faster traffic goes in the left. But during August, many truck drivers are on vacation. So, at the evenings and nights, E6 is pretty much empty. So on August 24, 2007, I started traveling by car towards Oslo from Husqvarna, a distance of almost five hours. The idea was to stay for some hours or so, and then go home again. So I left early in the morning and arrived at lunchtime in Oslo. I met my friend Tobias and got to go with him to his job and meet his boss. We talked and joked around, and I immediately formed an excellent bond with the boss. And soon... I submitted my application to start working there. Afterward, my friend Tobias and I hung out at his apartment, we talked, ate, and had a good hangout. I forgot to pay attention to the time, and then I noticed it was already 11pm. Realizing I must go home now, I said goodbye to my friend, jumped into my car, and began my 5 hour journey home. I moved away from Oslo, and went into the dark, dense forest for an hour. It was a full moon so you could still see pretty well, even without street lights. After driving for an hour and now finding myself with a dense forest on both sides of me, I see in the rear view mirror how a car, a Volvo 240, pulls up behind me very close. I don't drive too fast or too slow, and since it's a two lane road, I think that if they're in a hurry they can just overtake me in the other lane. After a while, they did overtake me and pass me, but then, they turn right into the right corner of the road and stop in front of me. I must quickly turn into the left lane to avoid crashing into the Volvo. I look into the rearview mirror as I continue driving, and soon they get up behind me again and are very close. And soon they overtake me again, and this time they drive away a bit and then turn into the right lane. Again they stop, and then the back door of the Volvo opens, and a massive man in his 30s jumps out and walks toward my car. I'm starting to feel uncomfortable about this, so I'm definitely not going to stop. I turn around again, 
go into the left lane and pass the man in the car. As I drive by, I see the man trying to grab the door in the passenger side of my car. Now, I absolutely panic and increase my speed to get away from them, but they catch up to me and do an overtake again. They stop a little way ahead, and soon the same man jumps out again and tries to make another attempt at my door. The drive continues and the same thing repeats itself over and over again. Soon I catch up with another car and I get behind this car, hoping that the people in the Volvo will get scared and give up because we are now not alone on the road anymore. But when I lay down behind this car, they and the Volvo overtake me and the other vehicle and lay down in front of us. The vehicle between us must feel threatened because after some short time, the car between us drives out on the left lane, overtakes the Volvo chasing me and accelerates and soon disappears. I pick up my mobile and dial the emergency number for Sweden which is 112, but the automatic voice operator says the number is not in use. Since I am in Norway, the Swedish emergency number does not work and I did not know the Norwegian emergency number right then and there, I call my dad and hope he's awake. My dad answers while the hunt continues in the same way as before. I explain with panic what is happening and want him to help me find the emergency number to Norway. My father is a very calm individual and rarely gets upset. He probably didn't understand the seriousness of the situation either, so he said, take it easy, try to drive away from them and stop and then ask what they want. After a few attempts to get my dad to cooperate without success, he's clearly not getting it. So I hung up and threw the phone in frustration in the passenger seat so that it bounced down between the floor and the heart and disappeared under the passenger seat. Soon, I am approaching Halden, a small Norwegian town. I see a sign showing an exit lane to the right. I think that now I am saved. I can turn off the E6 and the car chasing me can hopefully leave me alone. But to turn into the exit lane, I have to slow down. When I slow down, the car chasing me comes and drives around up on the exit lane in front of me and parks across it at the end, so that I can't go off the exit lane and exit the E6 because they're now blocking me entirely. So, with nowhere to turn, I have to continue on the E6, and the panic is now massive. I'm terrified, and now I decide that they won't be allowed to overtake me again before I border to Sweden. So, I accelerate up to 160 kilometers an hour, and they don't manage to overtake me. They only tend to drive up so that they are almost level with me. I look towards them and see how four people in the car are sitting, shouting something at me, and lunging to try to run into my car with their vehicle. We will soon be coming up to a large suspension bridge between Norway and Sweden. I panic and think that if they run over me or if I lose control of the car at this speed, I will fall through the railing and down about 50 meters if not more. But we get off the bridge and shortly afterward there is a small truck stop where trucks stop and rest and show customs officers what they have in their cargo. I quickly turn off and those in the Volvo continue and I see how they disappear on the E6. I stop in a parking lot inside the truck stop and just breathe. Now finally it's over. I thought, but it turned out this was far from over. I bent down toward the passenger seat and tried to find the mobile phone that was under there, but I can't find it, so I leave and walk towards the customs house, which is closed. But there is a payphone outside, and I pick up the phone and dial the emergency number 112 and arrive and get connected to the police. I explained what has happened and where I am now. They tell me to get back in the car and a police car will come within 10 minutes. I thank them and get back in the car. And I'm afraid those people in the Volvo will show up again after 40 minutes without the police. So I go out to the phone and again call. They retake my report and even though I say that I called and reported about 40 minutes ago, they tell me to again wait in my car and the police will eventually be there. Although that I say that I'm happy to stay on the phone with them until the police arrive, but they promise me they'll be there in a few minutes. So I hang up again. I go and sit down in the car and wait. Another 30 minutes pass without any police showing up. I sit and think about driving on. Partly I'm afraid that they'll come back here, and then I just want to go home. So after a few minutes and another attempt to find my cell phone under the seat with no success, I decide to drive on. It has been at least 90 minutes since I stopped here now, and the people in the Volvo have not come back here. So I think they are now moved on and it must be far enough away for me to be able to start making my way home. I leave the truck stop and drive out onto the E6 again. 
I drive for just a few minutes and come to a left turn. When I make the turn and come around to the crest of a new straight, I see to my horror. This Volvo is parked in a small parking lot next to the road. I brake to a stop and immediately feel the panic. I'm standing about 50 meters away. I'm considering turning around and driving against traffic to avoid passing them. But I don't have time to think more because the back door opens, two people get out and start walking toward my car. Another person gets out of the passenger side. The Volvo then opens the trunk and starts picking something out that I can't quite see what it is. When the other two men start walking toward me, they turn to the left side of my car and start walking toward my door. Then, I don't even know, I don't even think, I just press my gas all the way to the bottom and drive away. I look in the rearview mirror and see silhouettes of the people running toward the Volvo again, and I now see from the lights of the Volvo, and I now see the lights from the Volvo start up and shine toward me. I now understand that they are now taking up the chase again. I keep driving and realize I have a bit of a lead now. I was looking in the rearview mirror and saw them in the distance. A badger runs out in front of my car when I look ahead again. I don't even have time to steer away. I just run it over with the left front of my back wheels. Right after I drive over, I hear something from the car scraping against the asphalt. Something has come loose after the collision. In panic and terror, I must get off the E6 now. Terrified that the car will break down and give up, soon there is a minor exit on the left which I quickly turn onto and get away from the E6. When I arrive a little way up, I see a sign from a small village that is about two kilometers away. I can't remember the name of the town now. So I start driving on this smaller road towards the village, and I still hear how it scrapes under the car. Then I see a small forest and to the right at the turn in the street, I no longer see the Volvo in the rearview mirror. And in a panic to get far away from the E6 and big roads, I turn into this forest road and continue into the trees. The road is very narrow. There are two ruts, the grass is in the middle, and around the car are large trees. I drive further into the forest road until I come to an end of the road, and it's just more forest. I manage to turn the car around, and now I'm facing the direction I came from. I turn off the engine and exhale. Everything around me is quiet and dark, but soon I can see between the trees far away two headlights approaching. The panic returns. They have seen where I turned off somehow and now they are coming yet again. I see it's them, and when they break through the trees, I realize now that it's just survival that counts. I take my wallet and car keys. The mobile is where it is. I get out of the car, close and lock it. I put my wallet in my pocket, turn around, and start running into the forest as fast as possible. I hear people in the Volvo calling for me. I run more profoundly and deeper into the woods. After some time, I reach a small clearing and see a large stone under a very big tree. I climb onto that rock, grab the tree branches, and climb up. There are thick leaves on the components, and soon I have risen to the middle of the tree, and I am entirely hidden. I sit down on a thick branch against the tree trunk, breathe, and listen. I am convinced that I will not survive this night. They will find me, and now I can do no more to get away. And no one knows where I am. I think of my friends and my parents. Will they ever find me out here? Will they ever know what happened to me, or will I just become a missing person case? When I sit and I think about it, I hear how they are walking in the forest, looking for me in the distance, shouting, We'll find you! But luckily, they never came near my tree. I hear how they get deeper and deeper into the forest, but soon they turn and go back. I see everything through the leaves, their flashlights as they search through the woods. I soon hear how they continue back towards the cars. Then it's quiet. I dare not leave the tree. I stay there until it's morning and the sun has risen. Then, I climb down very slowly and very thoroughly and walk quietly back towards the car. At this point, I'm absolutely terrified that they will be standing there waiting. I'm pretty sure they wrecked my car, but when I go to the road again, I see my car. The Volvo is nowhere to be found. It seems they haven't even touched my car. After this, I just... I just went home. I tried to forget all about it. Until this day, I don't know what their case was all about and what they wanted, or what would have happened if I had let them talk to me. Honestly, I'm terrified to find out. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true Cryptid Encounter horror stories. If you enjoyed these stories, be sure to slap that like button, as it helps me out a ton.
The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube pushes it to fresh new eyes. If you're new here, be sure to join us, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode. I upload new videos almost every single day on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. I'd love to know what story tonight was your favorite in the comments down below. It's great to see your reviews and it helps me pick better stories in the future. Again, if you made it to the very end, I'd love to see you comment the code word. Today's code word is white creature. I would love to see the funny comments you guys come up with. The funniest comment will be pinned at the top per usual. Thank you guys so much for supporting the swamp the way you do. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy episode.